You're listening to The Vent Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vent Podcast. My name is Brady, joined once again in studio by the illustrious Billy Galenko. Hello. How are you, Billy? I'm doing very well. Very well, indeed. Um, I'm excited to share our guest with everyone today. Um, it's been a kind of a friend of the program. We got you got, we've actually gotten to meet him and taste his wines at his winery, which is not something we can say very often. Yeah, uh, Tomas Sav, who is the um, winemaker at Lingua Franca in Oregon. We um, actually we we didn't talk about um, when we had him on. We did mention to him that. Toma was one of the um, first po- folks to explain to Billy and I how cement isn't porous. <laughs> um, do you remember that story? Oh yeah. Um, and we were uh, we well, we were in Oregon, um, and he was giving us a tour of their facility, mm-hmm. which had just was just a couple years old, I think. And I think they had maybe just recently like re outfitted it with some new equipment and tanks and stuff like that. I think they also resealed the floors. Um, They did the floors and they got some eggs. They got some concrete eggs. Yeah. And so we were talking about the concrete eggs and um, we were talking about whether or not we were debating whether or not concrete was porous or it could be whether or not you could like actually in practicality describe it as a porous material. (laughs) And um, yeah, his uh, description of. yeah, how liquid may or may not move through concrete was um, pretty funny. I think he, what do you do? Pour water on the floor? Yeah, that's said, that's where the floor came. And he's like, off. no, see, we have the floor because yeah. it doesn't sink in. Like, and then he pointed that out. And then, <laughs> yeah, no, that was because I was like, I was mentioning the mouthfeel. Um, that concrete always has a distinct kind of texture to the wine. And he was like, well, yeah, mm-hmm. it's not because air is coming through, even though it can come through like through the hole. But he's like, especially like the egg, the whole point of the egg is as something's fermenting, the yeast move it around and there's like a certain motion. And there are other attributes that come from those vessels. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Like, and we're talking about like unlined concrete tanks, but he was also like, and most concrete tanks anyway are lined. So that also doesn't matter. So I was like, ah, okay. Yeah, great points. Yep. Um, yeah, he's, I mean, has a really interesting background, spent some time as an intern at DRC. Um, we can get into that in kind of our formal introduction, but yeah, DRC, do you yeah, hopefully we'll get to go up and yeah, that's right. Everywhere. We might go up and, uh, get to see him this, uh, December in Oregon, uh, as a team again. So looking forward to that interview, but Billy, what did, uh, you said you, Tasted a few interesting things. I want to hear about the Japanese whiskey you had this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So we are holding true to our promise last week. We're going to have more of like a, what we kind of drank the past week here. And then we'll have tasting notes on the website very soon. We'll link um, in the show notes for this show. Um, It'll be an ongoing tasting notes. And then also I do have a, what we're drinking this weekend too. So that'll be exciting. But this past weekend inspired kind of by Tomas, um, I went to a New Zealand Pinot Noir tasting, um, which was pretty, pretty cool. I hadn't had um, Pinot Noirs from New Zealand in a while. Um, I've always, I've kind of told everybody that like uh, Central Otago Pinot Noirs are some of my favorite in the, in the world. Um, and I hadn't had any in a long time and this kind of re, redid it for me. But what's cool is um, we basically tasted down so... We started in Martinboro. We had one. We had went to Marlboro, which we had another one, and then we had four from Central Otago, but from different subregions there. And that was it was really interesting. Have you ever really tasted many Pinot Noirs from New Zealand? I don't know if I've ever had a red wine in general from New Zealand. Um, I think I've only ever drank Sauvignon Blanc. Really, not even like a Chardonnay or a Riesling or anything. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I guess Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling. Not sure if I've had Chardonnay. Um, just not a not a part of the world that I drink a lot of wine from. But yeah, now that you say it, definitely Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling. Yeah, I mean, so there there are certain areas, um, like further on the on the North Island too. Um, 
I guess like Hawks Bay, they're known for like Syrah and like the Gimblet gravels. So there are some reds catching on, but the the predominant red red wine that's kind of catching fire in terms of popularity around the, the globe and really re, being respected for its quality is is the Pinot Noir, um, especially from the central Otago, which is further south. So Martinboro for everyone is the south side of the North Island. Mulboro, everybody probably knows because that's where the Sauvignon Blanc comes from. Um, the north side of the South Island. Um, so the, those two were the ones we kind of started with. They were interesting one. The Martinborough had a little bit um, like very evident new oak. And well, all these notes will be in the tasting um, in the sheet. So I'm not going to get really into describing tasting notes, but you definitely had some cool influence from the ocean, but like, you know, a little bit of complexity, but it, it was a, a unique um, tasting experience kind of. And it, it was like, um, I'm trying to figure out the exact words. It was both like balanced fruit as well as some like forest floor and kind of complexity along with some oak. Whereas the Mar Marlboro was super ripe. Um, it basically kind of tasted like it was just very fruit forward and kind of monochromatic, which is kind of interesting because you're kind of thinking like, hey, are they just trying to make this to kind of go along with their Sauvignon Blanc or like where, where was it kind of grown um, in terms of like, was it a priority vineyard spot or something? Um, so that was interesting, but then moving down to central Otago, it was really interesting because there it's an area that's basically described as the only continental climate in New Zealand, um, because everywhere else is so close to the coast. Um, it's in between some, hmm. there's a mountain range to the West. Um, it's a little further inland. Um, there was a gold rush there back in the day. So it's kind of cool is a lot of the, the winds or the, the rains coming from the West are blocked by a mountain. So it's almost like semi-arid. There are rivers going through, there are some lakes. Um, so some areas are semi-arid and get really hot in the summer. Other parts can be like, and it's also decent elevation. So what they really have is some areas that are really hot, but good diurnal shift. So high daytime temperatures, low at nighttime. Um, other areas are just very cool. So it's producing this Pinot Noir um, with really interesting kind of complexity. And not to mention the soils are both like river gravel, um, other sedimentary things. So it's like a very free draining soil, which is it kind of, to me, gives rise to this two, two kind of key things that I've been seeing. One is like almost like an electric backbone. It's like, it's like there's fruit, but like, it's like almost like a bright singing kind of fruit, like the, especially some of the red fruit, but then it also on the finish and going out has this underlying complexity. That's almost like a forest floor, you know, hearkening over back to like a burgundy. Um, sometimes I guess you see the same balance of acid and, and complexity and maybe some Oregon ones, but I see just like this like bright through line of almost like electric fruit in a good way. And then there's also complexity um, down in Central Tower. And we had different wines from different regions and the through line mainly was like the, the nice bright acid. And then, you know, each region had its own complexities, which I can, I'll share in the notes, but um. Yeah, it, it was really interesting. I think you would really like them. Yeah, I think the way you're describing it lends more towards thinking about the Pinot Noirs from, like you said, say Oregon. So I think of underripe strawberries and things like that that might bring up bring about that characteristic that you're talking about. I've been eating that a lot of, of uh, dried strawberries lately. Weirdly enough, we can get them at the farmer's market. Uh -huh. It reminded me a lot of that because it was still kind of like tart, but the concentration of flavor was so good in a lot of them. Um, yeah, that's right. They do get really kind of tart even when they're like, yeah, when they're dried, which you would think they would just get really sweet mm -hmm. or concentrated in sweetness, but they actually get kind of tart. Yeah. Like the strawberries that you get in um, <laughs> like in a special K cereal or something like that. Yeah. Like the dried strawberries that come in the cereal box. Um, uh, on on that same note, so I went home and I was like, "Am I? Do I just like this? Am I just thinking about this acid because I've like that's my memory of it?" But then I tried um a 2016 Wrath Pinot Noir from Monterey um, up here in California, which also is known for like a diurnal shift and um, some other things. Um, the winery I used to work at actually grew some Pinot Noir in Monterey, and that one was compared to the Central Otago was so ripe and so lush and like not that singing acid backbone, even though Monterey is known for some acid. So it was just really interesting to compare like, yeah, like aside from like Santa Barbara and some North coast and Sonoma, like 
the California expression of Pinot Noir is almost like round and lush and fruity compared to some of these other regions with like a, you know, a, a clear linear backbone and some, some other depth and complexity to them. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, we're about to head into Pinot Noir season, right? You get to the end of the summer, early fall. That's ideal for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it doesn't change that much for you out there um, on the West coast, but it's definitely getting into Pinot Noir season for me. No, for sure. For sure. And then rounding out the tasting weekend, I had a, um, it was an Ichiro's malt uh, chichibu is the is technically the distillery, but Ichiro's malt floor malted um, 2015 bottling. And I looked it up. It was a U.S. exclusive. Um, we were actually at this Japanese whiskey bar hmm. downtown um, that apparently my fiance has known about and not told me about, which was not cool until she showed me here as a surprise. Um, but that was cool. <laughs> so I, nice. I quickly went through their very extensive list, identified what I thought would be the best price to value. And this bottle retailed, I think originally at like 250, but it's the cheapest on wine searcher now is a little bit of a thousand. Um, and it was only released in the U S so, so that was, that was pretty cool to kind of, kind of taste through. Um, I yeah. don't have a ton of notes, but it was like, we, we have some, um, you know, Ichiro's malt and we just did Hanyu casks. Um, and it's kind of the guy who helped mm -hmm. bring back Hanyu on that, that side of things. Um, he, we're not bring back. He, he, he had those bottles, like the, the playing cards, the Hanyu playing cards. He bought the cask and released those and he started Chichibu distillery. So I've been reading a lot about him for some of our collections anyway. Um, and we had some stuff in our, our rare whiskey funds. So it was really exciting to, to see that and it not be a crazy price. So that was nice. Yeah, it can be hard to find. Um, it can be hard to find interesting Japanese whiskeys in kind of your everyday uh, wine and spirit shop. I think stuff that at least near us that's widely distributed is a lot of the Nika portfolio. So the like the coffee mm -hmm. series of whiskeys, um, and then the uh, Nika whiskey from the barrel, which I think is pretty like. Um, benchmark in terms of Japanese whiskey or like can provide you a good kind of jumping off point. Um, so yeah. yeah, try some Japanese whiskey, maybe then uh, order something like this. So it looks like uh wine searchers, a couple different places where you can grab it. Um, Decanta fruit bat. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It was in little Tokyo. Their, their list is enormous. Um, they have like overpriced all the things that normal, like people would look for if they don't know much about Japanese whiskey, like some of the Yamazakis and some other yeah. stuff was like grossly overpriced, but you could tell that was like, you know, People can't think of anything; they'll get it. So I'm definitely gonna do research mm -hmm. on their list and go back and find more. But um, all right, now do we want to do our yeah. what we're drinking this weekend? Pivot back to wine and our our new segment. Um, go for it. Yeah, do you have one? Yeah, yeah. So again, what we're drinking is typically just a section in our our Friday newsletter for Vent. Um, you know, people widely kind of check it out. And my, my main goal with it, one, I try not to repeat wines. I don't think I have in two years, but it's possible if anybody wants to call me out. Um, second, I try to pick more of the obscure things. It's not just like maybe changing producer to producer. I'm trying to pick like unique varieties or styles. Um, so this week I have it here. We are going to be talking about Alianico from Italy. Um, it's like central South Italy, or I guess, Western South Italy, like the Campania, Campania region. Have you had any Alianico before, Brady? Um, it's possible for like at a few tastings, but not that I can say, oh, I bought the bottle, brought it home, opened it, did it. Um, tell me more. <laughs> um, so a couple cool things. One, it's always been kind of a grape that was kind of close to my heart because it was on my... Um, certified exam my sommelier exam back in the day and i was like oh cool mm -hmm. i i know this one um but basically what it is it's like a, a dark skinned red grape from down in the south and it's basically actually considered by some as considered like the third noble grape there'll be people who argue that it's more more noble grapes or if it's not included in italy so there's like nebbiolo up north san giovese and then this grape further south and it's known for very dark color very high tannin and very um, high acid. So needless to say, 
it ages really well, but it does need time. Uh, some people have compared it, called it like the Barolo or Barbaresco of the South, um, not in color, but in, you know, kind of structure. Um, mm -hmm. And it's basically grown around kind of that, that Naples, Campania, I think like Mount Vesuvius type area where it's really volcanic soil. So it's like a wine that basically has, you know, kind of this brighter fruit, both dark and red, but then develops like more intense minerality complexity over time as it pulls out some of these volcanic notes that it's basically been growing on um, as well. So I think it's 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 really interesting to me because it's such bright acid and the people have said it works great with like barbecue, for example, or any big meat, but it's like great acid and tannin, but also this kind of underlying complexity that maybe you wouldn't get from like, I don't know, like an overly ripe cab or something that's, you know, kind of a little... A little, little riper, I guess you would say. It may not be as much of a, a food wine as something as high acid as this. Yeah, so it's something, uh, yeah, it's a summer or late summer wine. There's uh, late summer barbecues and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking of it as you go into the, it, as it gets a little colder, maybe like a tailgate wine, because they tend to be pretty good um, price-wise. Um, but yeah, here, let me give you more than just my tasting. Um, here, I'll, I'll read the uh a couple notes here from wine folly for everybody's example that way i'm not as rambling um it says young alianico wines are known for striking strikingly savory flavors of leather white pepper black fruits cured meat that when aged develop the dusty aroma of dried figs suntan leather uh for a fan of those who are a fan of rustic earth-driven wines alianico is a star and then has a quote from this guy ian degata from the native wines of native wine grapes of Italy says along with Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, like I was saying is generally to believe be believed to be one of Italy's three best grapes in my opinion is far more. Um, I think to me what I thought was interesting is when you read about the tasting notes of these and the ones I've had before, they are kind of almost like Syrah like, like meaty and kind of peppery and their youth, but then they do develop yeah. almost more it's like sweeter. It's almost like a balsamic type thing down the line rather than, you know, just developing more and more kind of earth. It's like there's earth underneath, but it's like it almost like sweetens as it matures, which I think is pretty neat. Um, and then something that nobody's probably going to have um, any questions on, but I got to like I found it the most interesting when I'm reading in my my big wine grapes book here. Um, a lot of people claim that it's a, a, a grape of Greek origin. Um, apparently back starting in like the 1600s or something, 1500s, uh, people started claiming it was a Greek grape and that it was brought over, um, that the name kind of comes from like Hellenistic Helena, um, basically referring to Greek, but they basically done a lot of DNA tests recently and found that it's closely related to surprise Italian grapes. Um, especially even like, you know, further North, mm. um, some of that family in the same area. Um, I mean, further North, like Northern Campania, Tuscany. Uh, so they think actually the most likely thing is that it was named by the Spanish who actually ruled central Italy from like the 1500s to 1600s. I didn't know that according to this book. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then they think it was probably had to do with the name Llano, L-L-A-N-O, meaning plain in Spanish. And basically what the Italians did was they just wrote Llano like they would in Italian, which is G-L-I-A-N-O. Um, so they kind of, uh, yeah. So they basically made it wine of the plain, just Alianico, um, over time. And I think that was really interesting, way, way more convincing wow. than the, the Greek explanation. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that, you know, these, uh, varieties have been around, especially, you know, in Europe, we think of the varieties being within a region for centuries and centuries and so many different folks have um yeah tended to them maintained kind of the history and quality of them across time and others have kind of fallen off and had to be sort of revived i think those ancient histories of vines in a particular region are yeah really interesting to learn about yeah so if you want to find some go check out like uh the region a, a big region is called ba basilicata um that's a famous one um there's a sub region within there called vulture which looks like vulture um those are some really famous ones but overall if you ask anybody at a wine shop for any Alianico, it's almost always coming from Campania. They're growing a little bit in like Australia. They're testing some in China, but it's almost always going to come from there. 
and it'll come from one of those regions. So I recommend everybody check it out and kind of mix it in this fall as we start moving forward. Nice. Right alongside your uh, um, pumpkin spice lattes. Yeah. Boy, yeah, you're just big. Also, you said it's a tailgate. Yeah. Tailgate <laughs> wine. Tailgate wine. I wonder if Jay Hack drinks. Yeah. That is Jets ta- tailgates. I will message him. Perfect Jay Hack tailgate wine. <laughs> Watching some Jets games. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. Good what we're drinking. Um, let's introduce uh, Toma, which we've already kind of done. Toma Sav, who is the winemaker at the uh, really wonderful Lingua Franca winery in the Willamette Valley, Oregon. Um, yeah, really pioneering Chardonnay uh, in that region, which we'll talk about a little with Toma. Uh, Pinot Noir is excellent as well. We got to visit two now, well, a year, a year and a half ago, I guess it was, mm-hmm. um, that Billy and I got to go down. And yeah, I think their focus um, with recent acquisition by Constellation, it was Constellation that purchased them. Is that right? Yep. Um, has really gave them a lot of new resources to be able to continue to accomplish, um, you know, uh, maintaining the quality of their portfolio, um, as well as really, you know, trying to solidify Chardonnay as a, you know, a legitimate global option <laughs> expression of the grape, uh, there in Oregon, which they've definitely done over the last 10, 15 years. Um, it's interesting to hear him talk about how the merger with Constellation has, you know, uh, contrary to popular opinion about when large groups buy out smaller wineries, uh, that there's, you know, a decrease in quality or sort of a homogenization or something is interesting and, and really good to hear him talk about how Constellation has really just supercharged the efforts that they already had going on and kind of have, have allowed them to continue to do their own thing as part of that sort of premium line of wines in their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was a, the idea and I guess the winery itself was kind of, uh, spearheaded by Larry Stone, I think it was, who had like um, Evening yep. Land and some other things, along with Dominique Lafon, who is a well-known winemaker person, uh, winemaker, you know, from the Lafon um, family wines um, in Burgundy. So basically, they they had a mission of coming in and making these top quality wines, especially the, like some of the best Chardonnay possible in Oregon. And to your point, it wasn't a brand that would benefit from just scaling and buying fruit so it was really cool that constellation right realized that and they're like we just need to pump more into quality continuing to grow the quality and also to you know allow it to maintain over time i thought that was really cool and it's cool to kind of dive in to hear more about what they're doing to perpetuate that you know kind of making a unique oregon top grand cru style chardonnay yeah yeah, Thomas is a, I mean, he's had a ton of crazy experiences that not even folks who have been in the industry for a really long time um, and really deep in the industry don't get to have just in terms of tasting some of the top wines in the world from DRC and Dujac and the times that he spent there. So, yeah, fascinating to hear from Toma, um, a good friend uh, of ours and of the podcast, and hopefully we'll get to see him um, later this year. So here's our interview with Thomas Sauv. Hey, Tomat, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. Nice to see you. Yeah, the last time we were together, we were lucky enough to be uh, in person at your beautiful property out there in Oregon. Uh, It's good to connect with you again. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you. And I think when we were out there, it wasn't, it hadn't been long since y'all had done a good deal of renovations to the facility. Is that right? Um, I think just... Um, Yeah, we we actually, like, uh, as if, the winery you came in um, was actually built uh, in 2016. Okay. Uh, so it's a fairly new building. And then we, um, I mean, this is also in Lingua Franca. It's like, you know, pretty cool. Like we basically like everything started with Larry Stone, uh, Master Sommelier. And then he mm-hmm. was running, um, um, you know, his, 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 his life in restaurant, Chai Trotter, and then Rubicon. It's like, kind of follow him and his notoriety in, in, in the wine world. And then he decided to change to a kind of, kind of go in a different path in production, working for Coppola. Um, 
and then uh, the Unius family. And, and then he started Evening Land. So Evening Land is a project that was started by Mark Taloff. And it's basically was starting to work with one of the most iconic vineyard in Oregon called Seven Springs. I was living in 92 in EOMD Hills where we are. And, and, uh, and Larry was basically starting this project. And then, uh, in, in the process, he, he was seeking, he was asked to look at different piece of land and he was fortunate enough to just see and connect directly with the person that owned the piece of land across the street. And he ended up buying it in 2012. Um, as he was departing Evening Land. And, uh, and this became LSV as Ariston Vineyard, as well as Lingo Franca Estate. So, um, fairly, you know, overall in, in, in the scope of, you know, vineyard and, and regional history, it's a fairly young vineyard, but, you know, it feels like a lot of time for me. But, yeah. um, so we started in 12, planted in 13. Uh, first vintage of Lingua Franca in 2015. I was thrown in this amazing project at 27, uh, just like, hey, like coming from fresh from Burgundy and then starting, hey, do you want to help us? Dominique Lafon, Larry Stone. Yes, I want to make wine for you guys and with you. And then uh, build this amazing winery as an architect. And um, what you saw was like kind of a, a building that was fairly new and that I was really fortunate to build. So, yeah. So how did, how did you first connect with Larry? Because you were coming from Burgundy. Were you at DRC at that time um, in Burgundy when you met Larry or how, how did that story go and how did you guys get connected? Yeah, there's a, there is a DRC connection for sure. Um, that has kind of, that's kind of interested. So, um, so my background is I'm French, grew up in the Northeast, um, you know, I, my family's in the medical field. I almost did the same thing, didn't work out. And uh, my my dad is from Burgundy and I uh, was very fortunate very early on to touch, you know, amazing, I mean, drink amazing wine and, and, and stuff. My family loves this. And I went to Burgundy every couple of weeks to see my grandparents, um, loved it. It became a passion when 15, 16 years old, I was like getting subscribed subscription to the equivalent of, of wine spectator in France called La Revue des Vins de France. And then, cause kind of this wine nerd, you know, and, and there was no 21 alcohol prop, I don't know, age <laughs> in, in France. And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, Sunday, Sunday lunch, sipping a little bit of wine with, with the family. And, and so I loved it. I think there was a cultural food science aspect. So I decided to, you know, study, um, Wine making and through the past of that, I, I got very fortunate to 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 meet so many great people and then um and one of my my last internship was to actually like kind of I, I that's kind of the pinnacle of my youth like internship. I, I was fortunate to uh, work a year and a half at DRC, um and um and and then after that I came to the U.S. and when I came to the U.S. Um, I was a seller at Evening Land, so I worked across the street. Larry was already gone. And at IPNC, which is the oldest Pacific Northwest wine event, uh, that happens every year, like the last weekend of July, um, very, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the, in the, in this, in this amazing celebration and, um, as a board member. And then I, anyway, I, I met Larry in 2014, uh, was Bar. Uh, Pio and Caesar, there is like Pascal in Le, Pascal in Le Peltier, there is like in a little, like, um, um, there was so many amazing winemakers and distributors in this place where IPNC is sipping on like Leroy's wine and stuff. And Larry was there. So I meet Larry and then I meet Larry and he's like, Hey, are you, are you this, this guy that worked at DRC? It's like, I just was there like a month and a half ago to taste. And it's like, so I didn't work there. I interned there, you know, and I, <laughs> and, uh, and it's like, oh, okay, blah, blah, blah. And that's kind of where we started to meet. Uh, we met for the first time. Um, and, um, and after that, we're just starting to discuss and, and, um, and, and be able to connect. So, um, I met him and then Raj was very kind, giving me his personal contact. And then, you know, I think that's, 
I was always been curious about what's going on across evening land. And I asked Raj, hey, can I reach out to him? So just go ahead. You know, he's my mentor. You should just talk to him. And this is how this happened. Sorry, go ahead, Billy. Here. Um, that's kind of crazy. Did you, were you familiar with people like, I guess Pascaline is, is French, but she was working in New York and, and there was like Raj and, and other folks. Are you, were you familiar being in France of some of the, the, the celebrity sommeliers, I guess, in the US? Or were, it, were these names you had to kind of learn as you got introduced to some of these folks? No, I think, you know, in, in it's a very interesting, like the, and even now, I'm still like amazed because I just came back from France and I was in a, in Paris with my brother and stuff. And there's just a world, a world of wine in the U.S. It's so different than uh, in the U.S. and in France, and it still is. And I think that, um, you know, I have to answer your question. I have no clue of like wine personalities in in France. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sommelier, right? You go to a restaurant, it's like you don't know names. And then I came to the U S and I realized it was like, Oh my God, there's Raj. And then you meet like Pascaline. And then you like, that's people that really have a really big influence on, um, they were very key opinion leaders, extremely smart people that really change the industry. Not only, I mean, the food beverage industry, um, especially beverage industry for a long time. And I, I think I maybe, maybe the court probably is a thing that's, contributing to this kind of effect and then i think everything else that we know of and just you know obviously like master sommeliers and then all the everything around it the media and such and and their ability to just you know basically like be who they are and and have access to all the swine and and connect and you know they're kind of like the those larry and, and raj were like I don't know. It's kind of the messiah. Of, well, we're gonna go to France and we're gonna just talk to this amazing wine and we're gonna come back and tell you all the secret in the sense. And it's mm-hmm. kind of amazing because they mentor people and such. And um, so we really went through like I think the U.S. hospitality industry and, and wine industry has been absolutely like in chance that it's big luck to be able to to have those folks and you know still have them. You know, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of like the secrets, um, maybe you said that they bring back to the States. W- what are a couple of things that, you know, maybe happen behind the walls of DRC that people don't think about, or is it just like any other winery? Well, a D- DRC is a, is an interesting place. And I think that, uh, you know, so I was, I was an intern. Um, so my, my, the, the interesting part of, of DRC for me was, um, that um, I connected, first of all, with DRC through my um, internship at Domaine Trien. So Domaine Trien is a domain in South of France that is basically co-owned, but operated by the Cess family, Domaine du Jac. Mm-hmm. And I worked at Domaine du Jac. And I really love the family. We just actually had, we just hosted a dinner at the wineries, um, Jeremy and Diana. Uh, when they came for IPNC, it was so good to see them. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I worked at Domaine Trien in South of France, but the domain is basically co-owned by Aubert de Villain and the Sets family. And so this is how I kind of was able to be introduced a little bit to, to this uh, world of DRC. And then little by little, I um, had a last internship to do. There was a very interesting research that was like in thoughts there. And um, I did the vintage 2012. And then to be very honest with you, like um, I kind of was like, well, this is going to be an amazing night on my resume, obviously. But I was a bit like kind of, uh, um, you know, DRC sometimes I feel like is a bit scary for folks in Burgundy because it's such guarded and it's like kind of a secret on its own. And I was like, I need to go. I need to see it by myself. But I'm also was like, well, you know, I, I don't really know what to expect. And then um, I came in and, you know, it's not really a secret to tell you. Like, it's like, it's one of the most like Grand Cru sites you can see. I mean, it's just full of secret because it's just full of experience and it's full of like 
history and like tradition and such. And there is, I don't know, it's, 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 it's an, it was an individual experience, just not of, on just on the one quality, but also on the, on the human experience. Like, I think for me, what's the most things that really, that I, I taught was, um, the dedication to that, what they have and how much their vineyards, how much the people were conning to make this type of wine and in the hand of consumer. It's, it's just, a, they really, Aubert de Villain, the Villain family and everybody were like so much like aware that they had, they, they have an important thing to carry that is basically leading with a lot of humility is the best domain in the world. And it's, I think it's, I visited a lot of great domain in the world and there is, to this day, I don't think there is, there is maybe another one I would say is maybe there, but I think that there is, there's no other winery that can be in that same kind of mindset, tradition, experience that DRC is. Yeah, I remember when uh, we got to go down there and visit. I was standing outside, and you know, there's a gate, and there's like a call box and walls around the, uh, and it felt like standing outside of like the White House or the CIA. It felt like, oh, I better not touch anything or do anything, or there's going to be a guard. Well, that's, it's, that's, it's, it's sort of the, the impression like, you have. Yeah, that's, it's the impression. It's a, yeah, yeah. That's the impression you have, but then when you just get in, it's like it's kind of this like I think this is something sometimes we put ourselves into, and I was the same. But then when you get in, you realize how much open things are, how much, you know, Aubert de Villain came every morning to shake hands of every employee at the, wow. the, the, the bell was ringing. Um, you know, it is such an important person that the wine industry has today. Um, and, uh, and I think they, and they're very much aware that they have an amazing, uh, patrimoine like kind of heritage to carry on and they're doing such an amazing job and they do it with like really modesty so i'm, I'm still connecting extremely well with um bertrand de villain who is um with his cousin perrin Leroy are now uh, officially the new manager of the domain and, and bertrand is actually like um um i mean a colleague still a friend, a partner with me, and and we have um, a few things like we're working with here in Oregon for him, and also um, he's helping um, to um, import wine um, of Lingua Franca in in France, and um, and you know it's they take this so seriously as far as like um, uh, their <laughs> their yeah I mean I don't know every time I I think about every experience that I had it was it was amazing you know. Um, like from, you know, the vineyards, the way how they farm to the way how like we were like basically looking at every bottle and bottling and label for everyone to the packaging, to the dedication of like, like every single thing is to be perfect for the consumer. But they don't do that because they they just believe in it. They just know they have to something to carry. And it, it, it's, it's, it, there's very few places like this. Like you, um, you mentioned there is a lot of like heritage and there's a lot of stuff that they do, um, that's good for the wine, but also probably cause they've done it for a while. What have you taken from there and brought over to Oregon? But then also what were you like, I'm going to do this differently because I think this is better for my winery or where, yeah. What have you taken and what have um, you like I kind think of it's moved like, away I think from like, as I you didn't started take, your own winery? Like, deep, I think I, I, you know, I worked in a lot of different places and I don't think I took DRC's kind of like heritage or like way to make wine. Um, I want to say like extreme, I mean, in this, I didn't basically like take everything they do and oh, I'm going to redo the same. This is now, what, you know, obvious, or I took a piece of it, but I took as many pieces of what I've learned there as experience that I did at Nicolas Potel or that I did at Domaine du Jacques and, and everything. But I think I was also like in the last, I, I think, you know, whenever you're in a trajectory of a, a career as an intern, it was like my last internship before I wanted to go in active world of wine. So I was still kind of, I think at, at this point I'd seen like probably seven different harvests and I, I just already came to the U S and I just seen, 
different things made in the new world. And I think um, the main takeaway for me was from DRC is the ability to um, basically there's a whole cluster fermentation process was I'm actually actually extremely unique. The confidence behind it was was incredible because you know the story behind it is for them is like well we believe that at least when I was there because you know there is kind of this like idea that DRC is not changing and not innovating it's so stuck in tradition but I it's it's really not true they're extremely like thinking ahead and you know but it takes your time and I think when I was there I think what I've learned a lot it was like their technique around the whole cluster or just the way how is it work whole cluster which to me i took a lot from um and it, and it's really made me gain a lot of confidence in this winemaking style for sure because whenever you just go in a place where you just have all this grand cru and you have very different vineyards and different aspects and terroir at the end of the day you really like kind of starting to like slightly understand oh okay like so that's how they do it that's interesting and oh that works Okay, that's great, and um, so that's one one thing. But a, a big thing that I always was extremely like um, grateful to have experienced is a human experience, and you know, um, there because um, there's not other place in the, the 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 precision, the rigor to things where just people have so much respect it's to what their farm and they have, but they also do it in a, in a way that, I don't know, you're gonna, you're gonna think like this crazy, but I mean, one night I came back off the day and then we all meet um, at the work to just kind of gather with the team, the vineyard team and the interim team and it was like kind of five, six people and then there was a bottle of wine sitting on the bench in the, in the farm, the farm shed, the vineyard shed. And then they, well, you should taste. This is what's just tried with clients today. And it was 55 of you know, and you're like, <laughs> okay. And then you just start your internship and you start getting exposed a week after to those wines. And then what he did to me too, it was like, I think I took a, I, I'm, I took a note of every single DRC bottle I've tasted. And I kept all the corks of what I was trying to like, get to. And it became, you can just be like, whoa, every time you taste something, or you can be like, okay, so I'm very lucky for the next year, I'm going to taste a lot of DRC. And this is going to really shape a lot of things in my mind. And I was trying to be like, this is wine, you know, but this is like probably the best I'm going to have to try. But, you know, we're tasting, uh, at the, you know, after, for people like love those wine, it's like, it's crazy what I had the chance to try and taste because their generosity and their, but most importantly, they are believing this is wine. They do believe this is wine. They know they have a big part to play in this world, but they really, this is wine. This is rich bourg, this is a good terroir, this is a chazo, this is great, blah, 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 grand chazo. And they still do it with simplicity. Yeah, when you, I mean, yeah, that's crazy to have such a, such a Rolodex of probably incredible vintages um, dating back so far. Do you, when you come to when you came over and you started um, your time in Oregon, what was kind of the ethos around winemaking in Oregon then versus now, and how do you think that maybe lingua franca has tried to contribute over the last? What is it now? Did you say 10 years, nine years? Yeah, we're like first vintage is 2015. 2015, uh, yeah. So it's like, it's been like, it's going to be, you know, vintage number nine, eight. Um, but um, so I think uh, this is a very interesting question. And I think there's so many full and so many piece and, and things to discuss about this. I think um, wine, wine, wine making, vineyard farming is such a constant dynamic and you are basically like at the service of the climate, the climate change, your service of the trends, your service of things you don't know. And Lingua Franca was super interesting because we're basically like, say, Hey, Larry Stone wants to do this. Let's go. And 
he had a vision and I was here to execute to me is the way I read it is how to execute his vision working with Dominique Lafont in a vineyard that was never produced wine. So here you have two choices here, right? And for me, I was like, well, listen, I'm going to be the first one to make the wine from this incredible site. Let's go. And it, it was fascinating because you are like learning to make wine from a place that nobody touched it. You don't know how it behaves. And so you got to take a little bit of step back. Yeah. So yeah. for me, I think that it was perfect because I came here and I was like, well, we are just going to open a new book and we're going to write the first chapter and let's go. And so after that, chapter number two, chapter number three, and then chapter number one, I came here, I was young. Um, I was coming really fresh for, from all those experiences. I was full of ideas. And also like I was working, well, I still work, we still work with Dominique Lafont and Dominique Lafont has historically not been a big, massive use of, user of whole cluster. I mean, he's doing it. He always did it a little bit, but this is, is very like known in the industry to be worked with the stem fruit, giant disciple and stuff. So for me, I was like, well, wait a minute. Like I'm going to learn what's doing it, what he thinks about this type of fruit, you know? So, you know, I was like putting whole cluster, some wine and stuff, but you know, I need to be doing it also the way I want based on the agronomy, based on the ripeness, based on such. And so, you know, this timing, it's really a, it was a good tool for us to like start explore, uh, exploring what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, 2015 was like, Hey, let's go. Larry was like, I want to get fruit from around my site. And Dominique was like, I was evening then just next door. I want to explore more. Dominique is a very curious speed person. So I was basically, Hey, like that's, this is what we're going to do. So we started with 4,000 cases from Chalonet and Pinot Noir. And then as we grow, you know, 2016 first vintage first crop of this vineyard um we're sitting on right now and it's you know you just like just fresh out of school oh you know this rootstock is going to do this this clone is going to do that and then you just can throw everything away and it's mm -hmm. not how it works you know i'm a young father and uh with two kids and their most difficult and beautiful thing we've ever done but honestly like you it's like, it's, it's like a baby vines. It's like kids that just, you don't know what's going on. You just like, Oh, okay. You don't, you cannot predict anything. Yeah. You cannot, you just, and you can't just like, you know, every, everybody's going to tell you this is going to happen. Well, no, it's not going to happen. And it's the same thing with the vineyard. So the vineyard at first in 2016, I was like, wow, wow you know, what, what are we going to do? And, you know, and, and it was, it was great. Like we, we just, this is the first crop and we're going to like make, beautiful wine and and that's all and so we i really really took and um, i really worked hard to make sure that we were making the most prettiest prettiest one we could from a young site and i realized a lot of people were like oh you know young vineyards don't make good wine i'm like no choice you have to and then I, I, i'm learning that you know it's it's amazing the balance of a young vines into a ground that is very new and stuff it's it's actually making fantastic wine. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then, you know, chapter three, you know, we're just growing this brand and, and, and seeing how like things are going to, are going to work. It's a startup. And then we start selling wine and, you know, and, and we're starting to have, you know, good press and people are excited. And then Larry's like traveling and selling to restaurants and such. And then, you know, and then climate comes in 2020 and then COVID and then, you know, and then we just, face like a, a time where you know in every business life you oh okay so this is what we've done we kind of reach you know there is a mountain we reach the first kind of mid you know mid 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 height of the, of the mountain and then how do we go how do we go to reach the top and then we needed some help and um i think both and resources and, and 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 also in 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 management and and this is where we are we we kind of started to work with, uh, with, with some folks to, 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 to help us find a, a partner. So, yeah. Um, we, we might, we might get to this later, but I kind of wanted to ask now that you're talking about the very beginning, how has, I guess, have you seen any change in, 
your growing season, like the average growing season since you started that may or may not be related to climate change? And then how have you guys kind of ad adapted your your style? Obviously, like Oregon's different than Burgundy and then Oregon's changing. Has this like led to different viticultural choices or different choices in the winery? Yeah, um, I think that not talking about the climate, just the vineyards and, and, and such. Um, uh, Oregon is not Burgundy. I never thought that. Um, I always treated this region extremely differently. But the way I think about that for me is like you cannot, you cannot, you, you can never hide from your experiences, right? So for me, you know, I I learned how to make Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in Burgundy, and obviously, like this is for me the place in the world that basically is the best to learn. And at, to this day, it's still probably the place where you find the best. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the world. And my journey here is to how can we make the best Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the world along Burgundy that is not Burgundy. <laughs> and so I think um, what has changed around our growing season um, that is basically like we need made us make some change. I think it's um, once again coming back to like experiences and learning how we can farm better and such so you know i think um we are looking at like thinking differently the use of water thinking differently the use of um of um, um tilling versus no tilling uh, we're looking at like are we looking at the holistic approach of farming in the sense of like do we looking at the entire site because oregon unlike burgundy is at least where we are at and a lot of other wineries, a polycultural place where it's not just a vineyard. There's usually a piece of land around where Burgundy, like, as you know, it's like, it's all basically like parceled by AOC and you have a neighbor, you have 10 rows and then you have a neighbor and then, you know, you can be organic and non-organic and organic. And there is no way you can just like, basically like have a holistic approach, um, such like, you know, a, Ted Lemon, a liter, I always said, like, you farm the, you, you don't farm the vineyard, you farm the land, which I think is an amazing way to think about what we're doing. Uh, and in Oregon, you can do it. And I think that's an approach that is along the growing season, we're trying to adapt slowly and slowly with a team, with different use of cover crop, eventually, like, building a farm on the property, um, eventually, like, you know, having um, different, like, restoration zone. And make sure like we, we, we think about this as a whole, um, because I think this is beneficial for not only just for the environment, but for the, for the vineyards and such. Um, and then in the winery, um, I mean, in the winery, I think that to be honest with you, like we're just, it's, um, in the winery, nothing really has changed. Uh, you know, we, 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 the, the style that I want to develop and I want to show to people is I really like wine to have, finesse and balance right i just like wine that i don't i don't think pinot noir nor chardonnay needs to be big wine i don't think this is in nature of their varietals genetically speaking pinot is the worst grape you can find it's hard to work with. they have terrible tannin they're just like all the thing are like just very rough very thing and very rough very tough to work with and so our work is to it's a very fragile grapes you know so our work is to make sure that like, we make something delicate. And so we're constantly trying to think about making something that have finesse, delicacy, precision. And I think that comes to, uh, and I, I like to basically like make wine that the, I, I think the reflection of this finesse and always come with acidity and like freshness so not like big tannin so we need to be very diligent on how we're going to extract this tannin we need to be very diligent on when we're going to harvest we have to be diligent of our use of whole cluster we have to be diligent on you know and i think this is how we're um how we adapt to the year but you know oregon it's 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 a place where there's a lot of different crops there's a lot of different it's a very big like agriculture area and i think that um it's 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 just beautiful to see like all those vineyards are and it's like getting in and and the quality of it and the different exposure soils and you know it's just the beginning love it 
Yeah, when I kind of make mention that uh, Lingua Franca was acquired recently, well, semi-recently by Constellation, right, which is one of the larger wine, corporate wine brands uh, in the world, and they added, you know, Lingua Franca to their premium portfolio, I guess, alongside like a, a Booker, I think they acquired recently in Passive Robles and Schrader, maybe. Yep. Um, and so, you know, I think from the outside, a lot of people think that when large corporations come in and make acquisitions, that some of the things that you're talking about don't happen anymore, but it actually sounds like you're about to be able to do more of these, maybe uh, kind of these uh, painstaking capital intensive, time intensive viticultural practices that really have an impact. You're going to be able to do more of that. Is that right? And is yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. I think there's a, you know, prior to, all this process, you know, I, I was thinking the same. Uh, and then, you know, I think I was a little bit, I was very fortunate that I was able to be a lot on the table and the discussion with, with what was the plan uh, on their interest to come in and us being able to sell to, to, to the company, to them and, and, and why and, and what would be the plan. And I think that it, it's, it was to me, it was the best partner for many reasons. One, um, the leadership under Robert Hansen has been extremely, like, honestly, like, ideal for us because in their basically like idea of premiumization, you know, they have a, a roadmap of like Robert Mondavi is such an important piece of not only California or the portfolio that they really want to revamp this to a higher standard and quality. Hmm. So. Part of this was Robert and Monavi, and you know, we, if you all love wine, we all know it started that, I mean, the wine industry, not only in the US, but in the world has been highly influenced by Mondavi family in, 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 in a very positive way. And so I think that's a very good strategy map. And then by then it's acquiring different brands and trying to let them run in the same culture and such. But we're not just talking about wine, we're talking about people like we, Everybody that where I was at Lingua Franca with me stayed at Lingua Franca. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really showing that the people like were really want to just like looking forward to what we can do. And another thing happened um, in, in this vein that's like showing their determination to do the right thing. Like we were organic, uncert non-certified since the beginning and Constellation, like we want you to get certified. And the reason being, it's not because we want the stamp. We just think this is how we should go. This is what the world needs and et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that was very first, very important. Then, you know, obviously it's a big hope that we have a lot of like, not only like a lot of opportunity and resources, obviously financial, but we also have a lot of resources in terms of mind power and brain power of people that has done that for a long time. Yeah. I mean, like I have a lot of colleagues that I'm like, I just always like, wow, that's amazing. You guys do this, do that. And on top of this, I think we're honestly, like at the end of the day, we're, it's extremely well positioned for us because we're making wine with delicacy and finesse. And, you know, we're talking with bookers that is obviously making pass of robes. It's like, like, you know, wine was like a bit more structured, bigger wine, same for Cabernet from other places. And so I think we fit really well into kind of like a place where we're with them and, and we're taking a big, um, and, and I think what I really appreciated was there them to listen about our desire to become the leader in the Chardonnay world in Oregon. You know, I think mm -hmm. Chardonnay in the Willamette Valley is is something that is has been in the work by the industry for 40 years. And I think that today we are at a turning point in which Chardonnay and Pinot Noir may become not as important yet, but Pinot Noir is, you know, but Chardonnay is taking a great um, growth and in the market and, and, and desire by consumer and also like the showing them in the Oregon are better and better and better. So, you know, in this adventure of Lingua Franca that we started in 2015, where Chardonnay for us was a big piece of our business and, a, and our domain, I think that 
they really wanted to follow us on this and help us to like be a, a leader in the in the shadow name and it's been incredible to be able to work with so many new vineyards um and new areas in new clones and and discussing with like hey how we can basically make this Willamette Valley Chardonnay just such an amazing like amazing wine for people to to understand what Oregon Chardonnay is about yeah the uh, I think you're right about how you guys fit really well into that premium portfolio for them and it's it's good to hear that there is a structure where founders and and producers and their families can have an opportunity to you know realize some of the success of their hard work over maybe decades and decades in some cases and still retain a lot of that original vision um so it's exciting to yeah to hear that really what it does is supercharge you guys not necessarily alter the ultimate vision yeah right? yeah um, exactly so, so as so as good as the pinot noir is you really the focus is on chardonnay um, is, is that how you think about it? Or do you just recognize that there's an opportunity to sort of maybe, uh, like reshape Chardonnay versus I, I think, Pinot Noir? I think, you know, it, it's kind of a, a, a juggle or diff, a, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm, Pinot Noir is amazing. We make more Pinot Noir than Chardonnay. Hmm. This is it. And, uh, we still do, but. I think there is um, a few things in the valley that the, there is a there is a, not a trend, but there is people plan Chardonnay. People are excited about Chardonnay. People understand that Oregon terroir is made for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is we're like in a in a timeline where we need to do the work. Someone needs to do the work with the ability to talk to a domestic market or international market that we are not to be shy and show a wine that deliver as good as Burgundy for a price point that still can be a bit more interesting. And um, with Constellation, ability to basically distribute wine, not only domestically, but internationally, I think this is a perfect opportunity, not only for Lingua Franca, for the entire Willamette Valley to be able to show that, hey, like, look at that. There is... There is something going on in this region. There's people that way before Lingua Franca that have basically made the foundation of what a good Chardonnay is. And then we just need someone to just like trying to like go out there and say, hey, like, this is it. We're not going to say like, hey, there was amazing, there's, there's a ton of amazing Chardonnay. But I think this is really going to help if we, true to ourselves, like we, we're going to, really keep the quality like we're going to work with amazing growers that just basically make the best of it and and keeping this like freshness that we can we can provide i think we're we're going to be able to like um really show the world that like there is oregon Pinot Noir and there is oregon chardonnay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, circling back a little bit there are there certain i guess we when we've talked to some people about Oregon Chardonnay, basically they're saying that only in the last 10 or 15 years have the has Chardonnay really been planted on optimal plots. It used to be kind of an afterthought after planting Pinot Noir. Are you seeing, is part of the quality increase, some of these vineyards that have been planted in the last decade or so coming online or like really, you know, maturing? Or is it more just an additional focus from everybody trying just to put more time and effort into making the wine? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that, you know, I'm not, I'm only been here for 10 years, but I think, uh, there's so many different answers to your question. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I mean, this, I mean, this winery in the room, I have a TV right now running through Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill, the vineyard that was planted in 95 in South Salem. And it's not, was not a, de not necessarily desired, like kind of area to grow grapes. And this is sitting at 600 feet elevation on pure volcanic soil. And this vineyard is extraordinary. So, you know, so to that, to that, you know, people don't have, they, they did the bets and they did plenty five acres. Now, a lot of people, obviously, I probably see the opportunity, like not only for like steel wine, but you know, there's kind of a, a little bit of growth of, I mean, of sparkling and obviously they use Chardonnay for sparkling. So there is a bit of that's there. And then there is also a little bit of 
it's it's kind of like a trend like you know people are planting vineyard today and they're thinking are we planting also only Pinot Noir or can we just also plant Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and is that the right place and such so I don't necessarily think that um, before it was not been on the right place I think there is definitely um, historically like a clonal selection that was probably not correct uh, for the region and I think that really kind of put people a bit like oh Shannon is maybe not suited for the climate here, but with obviously recent, you know, with the evolution of the climate and such, like today, like those clones that were planted like 40, 50 years ago, that didn't work in a sense. I don't know. I was not there, you know, but today we are thinking about obviously planting them again. And so, you know, I think, um, I think it's a very it's a very interesting like transition, uh, and also I think there's also a bit of Pinot Gris kind of shift mindset. You know, I think Oregon as a region is extremely interesting because we are in a place where we can only grow that much. Just the landscape and the Willamette Valley, and it's a very it's a, such a small place. I think we produce one percent of the total volume. In, in the US, but the aura, the, the, the Oregon is, is a very well known region, yeah. not only just domestically, just to the press, to the critics, to the folks in different region. That, you know, 1% of the wine producing in the US for the notoriety of the region that is real, I think we are in a, in a very interesting, interesting spot here. And so, because we cannot really like make this region being a California one, then it really makes it very unique and makes this, the folks, all my colleagues, all my peers being like, we are here to make the best of the best of the best of the best. And the Oregon mindset of being, well, this is, this is good. You can make amazing Pinot Noir of the highest quality, amazing Chardonnay of the highest quality, and still being in an affordable prices, depending to, you know, you know, some very high in California terroir or high in Burgundy terroir. Yeah. How, when, sorry, I want to revisit some of that. Um, how is it when you, when you think about um, putting together a portfolio of wines and expanding? Um, well, I guess I'll ask you, have you, was it part of the mandate from Constellation to expand the portfolio? Um, and how do you think about expanding sort of the offerings within both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, whether it be estate sites or bringing in other fruit um, and like trying to balance out your portfolio um, as the, you know, I guess, you know, you're heading into the first decade of Lingua yeah. Franca. So the portfolio per se didn't change. Mm -hmm. Like we have not increased our amount of skew uh, or Mona Cuvée, um, you know, Lingua Franca, we were selling fruit before. Yeah. We were like uh, to, to folks. And then so so right now, since, you know, our new partnership, we are basically like utilizing the vineyard for us only. That's mm, number one. Okay. And then after that, like the slight, like, you know, the growth is basically based on, um, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were buying, we, we actually needed to buy Chardonnay and so what we've done, we just basically, I mean, it was very simple. We just went to the people we knew mm -hmm. and we said, can, can we get a little bit more fruit <laughs> because it's good. And it's really, it actually was very simple. So my, um, you know, uh, it's, it feels like kind of painless a little bit of like the slight growth and just the way how we had to strategize because we, we had the estate capacity to basically like, oh, we can utilize the entire space now. We mm -hmm. can, we don't have to sell for this great. And we just went to see a couple of growers and say, hey, wow, you sell us five tons. Can you sell us like, you know, 10, 15 tons, right? Yeah. And then yeah. Bunker, Bunker Hill, the vineyard that's five acres had another 12 acres to develop. Oh, let's just, you know, it's developed now. It's producing. So we're going to receive the fruit this year. That was done pre-consolation, but boom, another kind of source of fruit. And then, 
you know, we are engaging um, right now. We are basically like we had six, six additional acres to plan on the property. Boom, we're going to do that next year. So, you know, it's very organic and it's very like working well, but we have not like, like we, you know, we're very tight with, I mean, Larry's vision on how we want to do. I was this morning with a lot of my, a um, couple of my bosses and we tasted all the 21 vintage and yeah, we have the same amount of Chardonnay we had like before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you looking at uh, making acquisitions of more vineyard property? I'm, I'm sure every time you will, but is that on the immediate horizon or is it really trying to keep the estate size that it is? Um, so currently the estate is, we cannot, we cannot really like increase the estate as it is. And mm-hmm. so um, I think that um, if, I mean, at the moment it's all in discussion, like, are we going to, how are we going to, how, how are we going to slightly like um, kind of like supply I guess our Willamette Valley and, and how do we want to control? Do we want to rely on amazing relationship with work? Do we want to farm it? It's like, this is a big question we have for the next few years. Um, I really don't have the answer. And I think it's going to take a lot of like different like thoughts with other folks um, and my colleagues. But um, the, the great, the great news that we have is like, we, I, we know we have opportunities. We know we have the support of, of the brand. I think our, um, you know, I think that a lot of um, indicators shows us that the, you know, there is the, the success of the brand remains intact, and even I would say it's actually working great. Uh, I think mm-hmm. we still had a few people that were questioning um, like this change, but I think the fact that literally everybody stayed from. The as one maker that became one maker with me, Kim, and then Joe, who, who as sale master became like you know, uh, as one maker, and then Josh, who is was our basically like Larry's protege and and um, and director of trade sale, became the brand manager and has been working with me since 2016. It, it really shows that um, you know we we have a, a great foundation and uh, the brand like before seems very. Their line um, and, and and truthfully like um, basically like follow us and want us to like support us right so yeah. we we've been in a lot of great restaurant international markets works really great um, and um, so yeah we we're gonna have to see a little bit how it goes and and take the right decision but yeah. Back when we were talking about DRC a little bit and, and the legacy there, you mentioned there was another producer that maybe even somewhat might get close to them. Who is that producer? And want to talk a little bit about what you're uh, just oh, personally, yeah. what are you exploring and drinking and what are you excited about? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, um, you know, whenever you go in cellars and, you know, once again, you know, I, I just, I think every place you go, um, it, it really brings you an idea of like how they make one and stuff. Dujac family was fantastic. Um, and you know, they, they really treated me in, in a make it, it was fantastic. Uh, and then, you know, DRC was something obviously a very unique. Um, I think the domain, the state that I found extremely interesting to me was, um, screaming Eagle. For me, I was really, really like, um, fascinated by, the vineyard, the winemaking and such. And with my experience of visits and such, I mean, there is a lot of wineries I would like to visit in Italy and, and, and South America and, and others in California. But I really found Scrimingle to be in kind of in a, in, in, in a respect um, and in a precision and a rigor that is, you know, there is humidity. They understand what they have to do. Um, and the wine resulting from it, it's so pure, you know? So I don't know. It was, it was, it was, for me, it was something that that's a domain. And what do I drink? I just came back from France. So, um, I was, uh, you know, it's my birthday today and tonight it's going to be cocktails because I just came back from like, no more wine, wine. no more wine, please. No, no, no. I, so <laughs> Darius, I was like, I was like, uh, we have a, um, my, my colleague here, Jamie, who is like working the cellar with us. She was like, well, why? And I was like, well, you know, it's an interesting question, but I think that 
you know, I just literally drink amazing wine in France from like a lot of different places. And I just realized like, you know, I just happened like a week ago and I just came with a pet harvested in two weeks. And I'm just like, you know, my, my memory is like, I just want to keep this memory there. But I think was the most important thing in France. I, I was very fortunate to spend time with some of my best friends I was in school with. So one has a, an estate in Dijon, uh, sorry, in Macron. One has an estate in South of France. My other friends, my best man has started a, a, a winery in Basque country. And um, uh, it's, it's emotional to see that he started in 18, 19, and he's like basically starting his, his own domain. He's planting his own vineyards. And then today I taste his wine and it just, it's, it's so amazing to identify his personality to the wine he makes. You know, he's making tomatoes. And tenant, we all know that it's like, man, this wine is impossible to drink for two years. And then you just taste his wine. It's like 2020. And it's like so like fantastic, precise, uh, and refined. And like, you know, and um, we, I really, I said, you got to bring that in the US. This is going to really like, oh, this is going to change the mindset of people. You know, it's like, it's been, there was this AOC called Iroulegui, which is in French Basque. Um, part of France, and uh, it's it's a little AOC with a couple of um, winery we may know in the U.S., such as um, Domaine Arechea that is imported by Kermit Lynch, which makes a fantastic wine. And and you know he worked with them a little bit, and then now he's starting his own thing. And then and then um, yeah, his, his domain is his domain is called Domaine Etchondoa, E T X O N D O A, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think the sky is the limit for him. Um, um, he was trained at Gigal for seven years. He really changed, I think, at Gigal when he was there right off college. And he decided to go back to his hometown. So I drink a lot of those wine in France. I was so happy to like discover new things and discuss like how the landscape of France is. And, you know, my, my other best friend is vineyard manager at Moitié Chandon. And it's fascinating to hear what are they doing there um, and the way how like they, you know, the, the basically what they're doing to, you know, LVMH is such always ahead on a lot of things and in the vineyard and such, it's, just, it's incredible to hear all the things to do. So drink of wine, didn't really discover new things, but I think, um, just having access to things. And I don't, I feel like, you know, we were talking with my wife as like, Things just taste different in France, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's the same wine. It's just like... You know. <laughs> it's that long trip it takes. <laughs> if it the long trip. The and then, but I also brought, also brought some Lingua Franca wines. And then it's actually like where my wife was like, this tastes different here than it tastes in the US. And I'm like, well, yeah. It's just, yeah that's yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. So what's, so what's the cocktail? You didn't say. I don't know. It's in the... I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I think we're going to, uh, uh, I mean, I know we're going to like a, a kind of really cool new restaurant called Clandestino. And then I'm sure it's going to be some South American kind of situation. So I'm, I'm very excited. Nice. Yeah, we, uh, we very well might be in the Val- Willamette Valley in early December as a team again cool. uh, with our whole team. So we'll definitely have to get in touch and get your restaurant and cocktail recommendations. Absolutely, and just come to the winery. <laughs> yeah, we like will. It's a twenty twenty three vintage. Should be great. Oh, that's awesome, Billy. Anything else? No, no, no. You just have me thinking of what could be a South American cocktail. I only know like a pisco sour. So now I'll be yeah. That's what, that. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll, I'll send you an email and see. Like, but uh, no, the place is called Grandestino, and it seems to be like a really good, like, kind of South American influence, like you know, place in, in Portland. So I'm excited. Nice. Come on, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you and, guys. Yeah, it's awesome to. Um, oh, well, happy birthday too! Yeah, thank uh, you so for your yeah. Um, but uh, well, yeah, we'll have the episode out and, and we'll share it around with you. I know our audience is going to get a good, uh, yeah, a lot of great perspective, especially on this idea that um, uh, acquisition isn't the end of the line, but maybe yeah. Yeah, the opportunity for a lot of great new things. So, best it, of luck. It is indeed. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate awesome. it. Talk soon. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, that was our interview with Tomas Sav. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that. I hope everybody goes find some Lingua Franca wines right now. Um, but that is our latest episode. That will be the end for today. And next week, we will be back with another exciting interview um, with a, a personal 
connection of mine um, in the Psalm community here in LA. And I hope everybody gets excited for that. So until next week, uh, have a great week. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circulars amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.